is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for week eight across college football by talking to Michael Rondello of NumberFire.com, getting his thoughts on this week's games and uh, his overall betting process for college football. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at thepowerrank.com. And Ed, we talked about it last week. We talked about it last year. Ed Orgeron officially out at LSU now. Well, not officially yet, but will be at the end of the year. The circumstances of that departure are a lot weirder than we initially thought based on the reporting by The Athletic. But this is something you've been on for a while now. And now it is the case at LSU. I I never believed in Coach O as a coach and then looked really dumb in 2019 with that belief. And then kind of said almost jokingly, hey, what if you got fired in two years? Just like happened to Gene Chizik at Auburn, which was more a nod to just the overall talent that these teams have down in the South and that things can go from so good to so bad to so good to so bad again. So, yeah, it's it's definitely like uh, a strange situation. I don't think it was a coincidence that Colin Wilson talked about uh, that hot seat uh, last week when he was on the show. Uh, I, th- I think it was very much under the radar that that was even happening. And then, you know, we do get the news and um, yeah, I mean, I just think back to week one or two when I bet both USC and LSU felt lucky to go one and one as USC covered before Clay Helton got fired the next week. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like I can hear like the little voice of Rob Pizzola in my head. Like, look at the coaches, damn it. <laughs> Well, so, that's, yeah, that's kind of sort of what I had. Football. Like the week where all the batter and Meyer stuff happened, I had bet the Jags plus six and a half against the Bengals. So, like, it's kind of the same thing where it's like, I feel like I got lucky in that situation and then just never want to go near the situation ever again to escape there. We had Joe Ostrowski on the NFL show last week. He was betting the Raiders this week uh, with no John Gruden. We'll talk about that with Drew Dinsick tomorrow about the, um, the process you go through to, to decide all that. But it's definitely wild with the way things changed here at LSU. And I think you got to get a little extra credit because you said two years and it was actually a little bit less. I mean, like <laughs> assuming you stick to the end of the year, it'll be two years, but like a year and a half when the decision was made, that's real fast. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just take the win on it. I'm not, we're not, we're not going to, we're gonna, no extra credit there. All right. Well, either way, weird circumstance with LSU. We'll talk about that game that they've got coming up uh, with Ole Miss. Ole Miss, obviously central in the headlines right now as well. With Michael Rondello, you can find him on Twitter at Michael Rondello. He is a writer over at Number Fire. Does a lot of our college football betting stuff over at Number Fire. I think he has uh, stuff up for the weekday games this week as well. So. Check those out over at numberfire.com. We'll talk to him about his process for betting college football and his read on the week eight games. I mentioned that while Drew Dinsick on, that is tomorrow for the NFL show for week number seven. We're talking about his, uh, the back and forth he had with Rufus Peabody, talking about the way you determine how a team will differ after a coach is fired, uh, the method he goes through for that. Because I think it's a fascinating conversation. We'll talk to him about that tomorrow on the NFL side and get his read on week seven. Get that by subscribing to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. I, uh, I think we're on iHeart Radio still. I, either way, we're pretty much wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Covering the Spread. Hit subscribe and also leave us a rating and review if you like what you hear. Before we get to Michael, though, got to go back to last week and recap week seven. You mentioned we had Kyle, Colin Wilson on. Got to go back through what Colin discussed on that show. Covering the past. So once again, Colin Wilson, a writer over at the Action Network. Uh, we had him on to talk week seven in college football. You can find Colin on Twitter at underscore Colin one. Colin was on Oklahoma State versus Texas over 60 and a half. And it closed to 61. So a bit of upward movement there for Colin. The Texas offense just didn't really come to play in the second half. They didn't score in the final 25 minutes. Oklahoma State finished on a 19 to nothing run to win that game and close things out. It finished with 56 total points. So kind of a tough beat for Colin there. If, if Texas had done anything, he would have gotten that over, but couldn't quite get that in the second half on that one. 
Colin hit a pair of unders for Michigan State versus Indiana. He won the full game under 48 and a half points and the first half under 24 and a half. And both those hit pretty easily. There were just 16 points in the first half and 35 for the game. So no real sweats there, even in two wins for Colin for the Michigan State versus Indiana game. Well, but I think I think there was a defensive touchdown pretty early in that game. So sweating like the first might, couple minutes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Might, might have been a little bit. You always freak out with a defensive touchdown when you are betting the under. Yep, yep. Then, defensive touchdowns were uh, a thing this week. It was uh, a little annoying at times, but uh, or it made me ecstatic in, in one of them, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Um, but yeah, that one, even with a defensive touchdown, didn't really matter. Calling an easy win there. Uh, Colin had a spread bet for Georgia versus Kentucky. I was watching this game Saturday and I had misremembered. Yeah. I thought he had the full game spread. Um, he okay. didn't. He had the first half spread. Oh, good. Um, it was Georgia minus 13 and a half. So Kentucky still covered that one. But I Georgia. thought that he had the full game spread, which would have been Painful. the most annoying thing on the planet. Did you watch the end of that game? I was watching that end of that game with a bunch of people who had bet Kentucky. So yeah. it was. Oh, okay. Most, <laughs> it was the most exciting end of a blowout game. Well, That'd I was like, working. so I was, I was watching it and I was watching with my wife and I was explaining to her like what was happening. Um, because like, like she could see care? that I was like, what's that? <laughs> well, I mean, she's probably asking, why do you care? Georgia? Won. I mean, I didn't yeah. care cause I didn't bet it, but I was like, I was like watching it with like a lot of, I was watching it close, which you wouldn't normally do in these situations. And I had to explain to her like why it mattered. And then Kentucky calls a timeout with like four seconds left or whatever it was. And I was like, oh man, this is going to happen. They're guaranteed to score. They did. So if you bet, Georgia condolences. That's a rough way to go, but Hey, at least it makes the room you were with a little bit happier. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was exciting. So, you know, we had a good read from Colin on the Minnesota versus Nebraska game. He said it was a three and a half. And we talked, he said, if it got to four, he would bet Minnesota and it actually closed at four and a half. So, uh, which point he would have been back right. in on uh, backing Minnesota and Good read on his part, both from how the market would move, but also the game itself, because it was a tight game late in the fourth quarter. Minnesota's up by five, and then there was the safety uh, that happened. There was Minnesota touchdown, Nebraska touchdown to make it a bit closer again. Minnesota won by seven, but a wild finish and a great read by Khan across the board. And Ed, I think it was even a better read because part of the reason why he was against Nebraska was Adrian Martinez and his funky ways to give up the football and that yeah. wound up being pertinent once again. Yeah, it's tough. Cause that kid's so talented and he's actually yeah. throwing the ball decently at times, but man, the turnovers fumbles are weird. And as you said, uh, you know, they happen a lot when you hang on the ball too long. And that's uh, what appears to happen with Martinez a bit it is tough. Cause like he does have talent. He plays well, just one fatal, fatal flaw that just keeps on popping up. For other action, Colin was on Eastern Michigan at plus one and a half against Ball State. Uh, that closed at a point, so a point of, or a half point of movement for him there. Ball State got out to a 14 nothing lead pr pretty early on, um, and then basically back and forth in there. So Ball State won 38-31 to to cover. Colin was on Louisiana Tech at minus six and a half against UTEP. It closed at six and a half, and really weird, sloppy game because both teams turned the ball over at least three times. Louisiana Tech's offense... Couldn't do anything though. Uh, so UTEP won outright 19 to three in that game. Finally, Colin wanted to see the status of uh, Jake Hayner uh, for the game for Fresno state. If Hayner played, he wanted Fresno state minus three and a half. Hayner did play and it closed at three. Fresno state's defense was awesome here. Uh, they blanked Wyoming and won 17, nothing. So a cover there for Colin as well. So a good week overall for Colin. Again, check him out on Twitter at underscore Colin one. The other game I was watching, Ed, was Northwestern versus Rutgers. I actually had time to watch a Northwestern game this year, and I picked a game to watch, apparently. Um, there you go. Because you'd bet it when Rutgers was a one-point dog, and you got a lot of movement there because they closed as a two-point favorite. But Northwestern's defense decided to tackle for once, which had not happened the entire year. Rutgers, 222 total yards, 3.4 yards per play. Ryan Hilinski threw the ball downfield, which was really jarring like as a Northwestern fan to see a quarterback throw downfield, which I've not seen in a very long time. Um, it was not expected. I feel bad because I told you to bet uh, Rutgers when they were an underdog, but just a weird game across the board where both Northwestern and Rutgers deviated pretty heavily from what they had done up to that point. I mean, it's not your fault. I was going to bet them anyway. <laughs> 
just wanted your opinion on it. I think I had a closing at Rutgers uh, two and a half. Okay, yeah. So, so you get a further half point there. So three and a half points of movement, you're not going to fight that very often. No. Nope. Um, sometimes things just break against you either way. Um, so that's college football week number seven. We're talking week number eight here with Michael Rondello in just one second. Find him on Twitter at Michael Rondello and find all of his work over at Number Fire. We're going to get his thoughts on aren't really, really big games this week. We'll talk about the uh, Oregon UCLA game and get his thoughts on others across the board. But first... NBA is back, which means that so is FanDuel's free over-under contest. It is simple. Head over to FanDuel.com slash over-under and choose either over or under on each listed prop. You can make free picks for a chance to win a share of $5,000. All you have to do is make your picks over on FanDuel before every NBA on TNT broadcast for your shot at a big payday. Eligibility restrictions apply. Go to FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel app for more details. Covering the present. Let's bring Michael Rondello on to covering the spread to talk week number eight in college football. Michael, of course, does all of our work over at numberfire.com, talking some college football betting there and had him on today to talk about that as well. Michael, we appreciate the time. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me on. Excited to talk this week's uh, slate of college football. I'm just kind of bummed that we have you here on Wednesday. Like the show will be out before Wednesday night, but like we could have had you on earlier to talk Coastal Carolina, get some Chanticleers talk on, on the show. But, uh, you know, we'll give people a, a larger window. That's to all right. Here. Are you eyeing that game at all or no? Um, Not really. Um, You know, I, I think uh, Coastal Carolina is a tough team be- just because of kind of their schedule and who they play. I mean, you know, they're a pretty good team, but – they kind of have a, a weak schedule, so I haven't, haven't really um, had my eye on, the, on that game too much. Unfortunate. Uh, and a, a relevant game, too, because you're in Michigan, and they're playing Appalachian mm-hmm. State, and there's no connection, I'm sure, at all between Michigan and Appalachian State, dat- dating back a couple years. But um, obviously, you're a big Michigan fan. We talked to Ed plenty of times about Michigan as well, but thoughts on uh, how things are going so far this year? Are you allowing yourself to get excited yet or not yet? Um, I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, I think to me, the biggest thing that's, that's kind of held Michigan back in the past is um, their defense, which it's at times looked dominant in the last few years under coordinator Don Brown. Um, but it seemed like they had like a very rigid game plan. Um, and uh, that kind of, that kind of seemed to be their kryptonite. And I think the last draw was the Michigan State game last year where we got torched by uh, Rocky Lombardi and um, we seemingly couldn't stop the sideline throws one-on-one against our corners. And, you know, I, I you know, rolling out the same guys this year, um, you know, I don't think corner cornerback is the strength of our team, but, um, you know, Harbaugh firing – Brown and really rehauling the whole coaching staff and bringing in Mike McDonald. Um, I thought that really, hopefully what I, you know, I was hoping to see is that um, Michigan's defense could make, you know, be a little bit more adaptable to, you know, what opponents strengths are and, you know, can make better in-game adjustments and maybe it'll be a little bit more bend and don't break than they kind of have been in the past. So, so far, so good. Um, I, you know, the two biggest games, you know, left in the season, are of course, Michigan State and Ohio State. And um, I think both teams are kind of built to beat the Michigan defense of the past because they just have a lot of explosive skill players. Um, and, you know, that's kind of been a problem for Michigan. So I think, uh, you know, next week, the, the 30th against Michigan State is really, you know, I'll allow myself to be fully optimistic instead of cautiously if they if they win that game yeah i know i think you're right with uh with what happened with don brown last year as you mentioned it's the same guys in the secondary i mean they've added one new guy this year but they were bad last year and they've been good this year and it just goes to show you how volatile uh secondary play is um i i kept thinking that they weren't as bad as we thought they were last year. I thought the cornerbacks were in position on a lot of plays on a lot of plays in that Michigan State game and a lot of the other games. They just couldn't make the play. And I think that happens. And then, you know, Don Brown probably gets fired because Quiddy Pay and Aiden Hutchinson go down. I mean, you're, yeah. you're you're losing two NFL caliber pass rushers. And yeah, you know, should he have adjusted and stopped blitzing so much? Yeah, of course. But 
Um, even with all that said, I, I uh, well, I mean, you're stealing a lot of my thunder. What I want to talk about a little bit later, but <laughs> the, the early returns are that Harbaugh got this hire right, and this was the hire he had to have. He could, he did not have the luxury of screwing this up. And the early returns are, are pretty good. Yeah, they struggled in 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 a couple of of, of halves uh, this season. Uh, Nebraska second half, uh, Rutgers second half, but. But yeah, no, I think it's good. What are you thinking about the offense? You think they're going to put JJ McCarthy in a quarterback scene? I I could so I could see them playing JJ McCarthy and like you know say you know they show up to East Lansing and they're you know down by two touchdowns at at halftime. I, that's when I could see them playing JJ McCarthy for the entire second half. Um, you know, after some of these like highlight throws that he's making, that you know fan base is getting really excited and kind of clamoring for him to, to start, you know, certain, uh, you know, certain circles. <laughs> um, but, you know, Cade McNamara, he's, he's been really good at just limiting negative plays. I mean, he doesn't really throw interceptions. I think he has, he has one on the season and doesn't take sacks. I mean, part of that too is, um, you know, Michigan's pass protection has been pretty good, but, you know, it seems like he's, and he just says it seems like he just has this poise and this confidence that's kind of infectious across um, the team. So um, I'm I'm still kind of, I want to see him like air out the ball a little bit more. Um, I know that in m- more recent weeks we've kind of we've kind of seen that, but um, you know before I'm like all in on the the Cade train, uh, I, I'd like to see I'd like to see him throw, um, you know, make some bigger plays, um, you know, against tougher opponents yeah i mean i think i think we've kind of seen the ceiling of mcnamara in some sense um in terms of just a little bit of lack of consistency with some of the throws and we've seen the upside of mccarthy he's eventually going to take over this team i think it's a question of when not if i agree Um, and uh yeah i mean you've seen those explosive throws i would guess right now in practice that mccarthy's just not as consistent and uh uh, the staff is waiting waiting for that to happen. So we yeah. uh, we shall see. And 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 like you said, like I think the Michigan State game next week is uh, is very interesting because I think Michigan State's a little overrated. Obviously, put your obviously I'm a little biased in that, but but there are some good data reasons for that as well. No, I'm I'm with you there. I think I think they're a little overrated as well. Um, but you know, the fan in me, you know, I'm just I'm just not that lucky. You know? um, <laughs> So I, I kind of, you know, could go both ways on this game. <laughs> All I hear is we're disrespecting Ryan Helinski's bombs that are coming on Saturday. That's that's the only thing that I'm hearing right now. Watch out for the feisty Northwestern Wildcats, baby. Uh, said uh, entirely in jest. Let's talk here about some college football with you, Michael. Cause first time we had you on the show. We like to try to pick people's brains, see where their strengths are, see why their strengths are their strengths. So when you look at yourself as a college football better where do you think you're, you excel and why is that the case? Yeah, I think uh, my process is really based around trying to find overvalued teams, undervalued teams, um, and in terms of like where the underlying numbers, you know, say their level of play is at versus like public perception. And um, the way, I mean, you know, I'm not reinvent, reinventing the wheel here. I think the, the way a lot of betters do that is through power ratings. Um you know, my process, um, you know, includes, you know, an aggregated ranking of, you know, several different power ratings, you know, on, on the internet. Um, and the way, the, the reason I like to do like an aggregate is because, you know, I think the, not only is the average ranking pretty helpful to kind of see what I'll call like the hierarchy of teams. Um, but also I think, uh, having the variance of, of their rate rating as well. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, my aggregated ranking this week has, I think, Clemson number nine, and they're playing Pittsburgh, who's number 10. You know, Pitt, Pittsburgh's variance is, is pretty low compared to Clemson's. And so that kind of, you know, makes me a little bit more cautious when I'm betting teams with a high variance like Clemson. So um, and then so that, that kind of gives me like a, a nice high level look. I can make reactions um, when the lines first come out every week and then kind of go back and see where I think that that number should be, um, you know, based on some of the, the inputs to my aggregated rankings. Um, and then, you know, I, 
I always like to look at, you know, what makes a team successful and does that give them a particular advantage against that opponent that particular week? So, um, yeah, that's, that's really, that's really kind of what goes into to my rationale on picks every week. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the aggregation of ratings is a good thing. I mean, you know, my rankings are definitely perfect, right. But everyone else, has good things. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, obviously every, every issue, every, um, you know, it's kind of it's kind of like that wisdom of crowds of the preseason AP poll, right? No one ballot is perfect, but the aggregate is is a pretty powerful predictor of team strength, and and I think the same thing applies for for computer predictions uh, as well. Michael, you were talking about matchups. What what is your approach there? Are you looking at passing versus rushing, so on and so forth? Yeah, I, I like to uh, just you know different phases of the game. You know, if one team has a particularly good rushing offense versus a rushing defense, I think that's kind of the obvious. Um, another thing that I like to, you know, even go a little bit deeper in and, you know, I, I like to use the stats on uh, footballoutsiders.com. Um, they have some pretty good line stats and, you know, so much of the game is, is, you know, won and lost up front. And so kind of what teams have, uh, you know, specific line advantages over another, um, you know, that can be pretty helpful to look at as well. Especially because the discrepancies in college football can be large. Like they can be big in the NFL too, yeah. in terms of like, you know, uh, mismatches on one side of the ball from the line perspective. In college, the variance in quality is bigger, and that can get you in some uh, some seriously bad situations. So I think it does make sense. Basically, what you're saying is you start with the number and then slowly dig down deeper from there. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that makes a lot of sense. Right, Let's before, talk about. Uh, go ahead. Ed. Actually, Sorry, uh, before we move on, I did want to ask you, Clemson, for me, has been the most difficult team to figure out this year. They uh, clearly haven't played well, but, you know, number wise, numbers wise, they're not terrible. I just looked up my team rankings, which is margin of victory adjusted for schedule. They're 17th. They're clearly getting credit for playing the best team in America. Pretty tough week one, even though the performance seems to have slipped. You talked about. You know, you're calculating a variance in teams as well. It's no surprise that Clemson has the big, one of the biggest variances, depending on how you deal with data from the current season versus preseason expectations. You know, what do you think about this team? Like, are you betting them? Um, in short, no. Uh, <laughs> I try. I tend to stay away from uh, the teams with with higher variance, just because I'm I'm careful. Uh, I'm probably a little bit more risk averse. Um, you know, I'm definitely going to be keeping my eye on the, uh, the Pittsburgh game, um, this, this Saturday, because I just think that's a fascinating matchup, but yeah, I, you know, I think that if, if the number was a little bit different, you know, if, um, Pittsburgh was a little bit bigger of a favorite, I I'd probably jump on the Clemson train, but you know, I, I don't think that there's a particular advantage on this line. So I, I think it kind of depends, you know, week to week and what the situation is. But I would say like most of the time, I, I just, I don't like, um, you know, trying to figure out these high variance teams. Yeah. No, it's interesting because Pitt's a three and a half point favorite over at FanDuel. And if you would have said that line at the beginning of the season, <laughs> I mean, no one would have, no one would have hesitated to bet Clemson plus three and a half. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I mean, I like Clemson against BC. That didn't work out. Clemson did not cover against Syracuse last week. Or maybe that was two weeks ago. I forget. That was two. It was a Friday. But, I know. Yeah. But th I just feel like at some point they're going to start playing like Clemson again, if only for a game. They're still the most talented team in that conference by far. So, yeah. Yeah. I think we could, I think that, you know, we could see that this week against Pittsburgh. So, yeah, we, we shall, shall see. see. Interesting game for sure. And interesting team overall. They're always interesting, but I think extra very much so this year. Let's talk about the futures market here because we know there's kind of like a tier or two in the in the championship betting. But the same thing is true with the Heisman right now. Matt Corral and Bryce Young, both plus 175 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Are you seeing any value in that market as it currently stands, Michael? Or is it a stay away for you with where things are at? Um, you know, at this point in the, the Heisman race, I, I tend to, to stay away from the, the lower odds. Um, you know, Heis, Heisman race is, you know, kind of a, a tough uh, market to bet just because you're not betting like 
you know, you're not just protect projecting stats. You're you're trying to get in also into the minds of the voters, and I think some of the the narrative of the season kind of plays along with that. So, it, you know, it's kind of a tougher market to bet. You know, and this this year has been pretty uh, pretty crazy, um, given that you know the front runner at the beginning of the year, Spencer Rattler, has been benched. Um, so, you know, and, you know, another front runner, Sam Howell, like the North Carolina just hasn't played up to, you know, preseason expectations. So there's been a lot of volatility this year. Um, you know, I think if they were to name a winner today, I think it would be Matt Corral just because of how good Ole Miss's offense is and, and how much he has a part to play in their success. Um, but he just had 30 carries against Tennessee and Lane Kiffin saying he's not in very good shape. Uh, for this week's game against LSU, you know, 170, you know, plus 175. I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to take that. Um, you know, I'm probably more willing to uh, be just because of where we're at in the season. I'm probably willing to look a little bit more down the list. Um, I think CJ Stroud was like eight to one. I don't know if that's a great pick just because he's got, you know, two first round picks at receiver and, um, you know, that can kind of sway the narrative a little bit. Um, another guy that I would like, I think he's a little bit farther down the list uh, towards like 25 to one, I think I saw was Kenny Pickett, um, Pittsburgh's quarterback. And, you know, we just said like, you know, Clemson could come alive this weekend and, you know, that would, that would hurt his chances. But, you know, if Pittsburgh runs the table, wins the ACC, I know it's a, a weaker year for that conference um, and they're a one loss team. And, you know, he continues to play at the level he's playing. Um, you know, I think that's a good, that's a good uh, pick to take a flyer on. I mean, if you look at ESPN's QBR, I think uh, both of the favorites, um, Young and Corral, are in the top four. But the other two guys are Stroud and Pickett. So, and I think Pittsburgh throws the ball enough where, you know, he can get those volume stats. So, you know, it, not really like, uh, you know, allocating a chunk of capital towards one of the favorites and more just kind of taking a flyer on a guy and, and, and uh, seeing what happens. Um, but yeah, I think Pickett's uh, my favorite pick in that market. Cool. Uh, let's go on to some games. Uh, we have a big one out in Pac-12 with, uh, with Oregon at UCLA. UCLA is favored in this game. Total is up to 60 and a half. Um, what is your take on this game? Well, I think first, uh, my first reaction was I think UCLA would get the upset, but it turns out that they opened as a, a small favorite. Um, so I guess, you know, wasn't too surprised to see that. Um, you know, I kind of look at Oregon's body of work this year, um, you know, going back to the Ohio State game, really big win for them. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of uh, people kind of bumped them up into that top tier of of college teams. But, you know, if you kind of look at what happened in that game, um, a lot of Buckeyes miscues. Um, they, I think three drives ended in Oregon territory um, on turnover on downs. So, um, you know, you know, imagine if they get, you know, one of those um, conversions plus CJ Stroud throws an interception at the end, you know, when they're trying to tie up the game. So, you know, that wasn't like a super decisive win for me. Um, Ohio State outgained them yards wise. And, you know, so I, I think they were a little overrated coming out of that game. And then they, you know, a couple of weeks later, they play Arizona, who is just bad. And then um, they get outgained by Arizona in that game. You know, Arizona has like 31 first downs. So I believe Ohio State's, or uh, sorry, um, Oregon's uh, 17. And, and if I told you, you know, hey, um, Arizona had 31 first downs, Oregon 17, you know, Arizona outgained them. And I was, gonna, and, you know, I asked you, who do you think won the game? <laughs> um, well, you would probably say that's a trick question and, and know that it was Arizona. But if you didn't think that, you would say <laughs> you would say that it was Arizona and not and not Oregon. So, um, you know, they lost to Stanford. They looked shaky against Cal, you know. In my aggregated rankings, I do not have them close to 10. They're more like mid-20s. Um, and, yeah, I, I, I don't think – and you look, you look at, um, you know, their, their – you know, the same opponents, 
you know, they both UCLA and Oregon have both played Stanford and Arizona and UCLA has looked a lot better against those two teams than Oregon has. Um, so that was kind of my first um, instinct. I think the line has moved up a little bit, which, you know, anytime you see this early week movement, you know, it could be an indicator of like sharp money, which I think kind of gives me a little bit of confidence um, if the line moves that way. Um, and then, you know, as I kind of dig into matchups, you know, Oregon's been pretty reliant on running the ball um, this year. They lose their best running back, C.J. Verdell, and UCLA has the best rushing defense in the Pac-12. So I think um, this is like one of my, you know, more favorite picks of the week is just to, to lay a couple points with UCLA. Um, and I think it's really mostly because I think Oregon's overrated. Yeah, uh, UCLA minus one and a half right now at FanDuel Sportsbook, and that is minus 114. So you can still get the one and a half at, at FanDuel, just uh, laying a bit more juice there at minus 114 versus 110 potentially elsewhere at, at a larger number. I think it does make sense to to snag that right now. Let's talk about uh, the interesting game of the week, even if it's not like a high-profile game, LSU versus Ole Miss. Uh, Ole Miss, nine and a half point favorite, total here, 76 and a half. The big story this week is the Ed Orgeron stuff, which we talked about, uh, Ed and I did earlier on, but we saw last week the Raiders rallying with no John Gruden. Coach O is still here, though. Like, he's still there. So it's a weird situation, a really weird dynamic. And, like, by weird, I mean, I don't know how to analyze this. So how? what are you doing here? How does Ed O still being there impact your view of LSU, not just this week, but also the rest of the way? Yeah, I think it's kind of a weird move to, to make him a lame duck. Yeah. Um, I think in this particular situation, what I've what I've read, I mean, this this is kind of one of those situations that goes beyond the numbers, right? You kind of have to get a feel for what's happening. Um, you know, basically from from what I've read, kind of the writing was on the wall here. Um, you know, Ed Ordron's uh, issues at LSU are pretty deep seated, and I, I didn't think he was going to you know last another season. Um, so I, I don't know if, um, you know, the players' motivations change that much just based on this, just because I think he might have been a lame duck already. Uh, it just wasn't official. Um, you know, I, I think LSU has just been a generally difficult team uh, to figure out. You look at uh, their last four games, they've been outgained in three of them. Um, and the one – that they outgained their opponent was a loss to, to Auburn. Um, you know, the Florida game, you know, was a big win for, for Ordron. I think uh, some people thought maybe he just saved his job, which clearly he didn't, but um, you know, Florida turned over the ball a ton. They almost gift wrapped that game to um, the Tigers. And then, um, you know, their running back Davis price, I think some fans were calling for him to be benched earlier this season. He sets the uh, LSU <laughs> game rushing record. So, you know, how much of that is sustainable? I, I don't know whether this team has kind of made a breakthrough in the running game or not, but they just haven't been impressive in any of their conference games so far this year, um, you know, regardless of the Ed Ordron news. Yeah, it definitely makes it tough to, like, figure out how to handle things maybe that increases your confidence in your read on them knowing that they've kind of been playing with a lame duck for most of the year so the atlas you side may actually be the more steady part because as you mentioned matt corral's banged up and lane kiffin said i think monday that he's not certain to play we don't know that right now we're recording here wednesday we don't really know if corral will play so are you staying away from this game what's your read on this game right now with where things stand any betting value here overall read on this game as a whole yeah, I think, um, you know, with a healthy Matt Corral or, you know, close to 100%, I, I would feel confident in laying the points for Ole Miss um, just because I, I, you know, LSU doesn't have, you know, a stellar record by any means, but I think even they're a little bit worse than that record might indicate. Um, you know, they're they're pretty talented, but they've had a lot of injuries and their program's just a mess right now. Um, you know, Ole Miss has... You know, they've had, I believe, three conference games so far. You know, they got crushed by Alabama, as, you know, one does. And, um, 
they, you know, kind of eked out wins against Arkansas and Tennessee. So they, they haven't really been particularly uh, impressive either so far to kind of set themselves apart, but you know, their, their offense is just so dynamic. Matt Corral is, I mean, like I said earlier, like if you called the Heisman race today, it would be, it would be Corral. So um, I'm kind of waiting to see what the, uh, the news is. I'm, I'm keeping my eye on, on this game. You know, if, if they announce that Matt Corral is going and, you know, maybe we get like an inside to, you know, inside peek at his health status, you know, maybe I'd be a little bit more confident betting on this game, but right now it's a stay away. Plus the other thing too, is I think the line has moved down a little bit, meaning, uh, you know, a little uh, action on LSU, which makes me even more confused. So probably a stay away until we get a little bit more information about Corral's health. All right, let's move on to uh, USC at Notre Dame, a battle of two of my overrated teams at the <laughs> beginning of the season. Uh, I, I, I still think Notre Dame was a little bit overrated, but they look all right in the record department. They're a six-and-a-half-point favorite against the USC C team that uh, got a lot of questions about, total of 57-and-a-half. Um, Notre Dame's got a quarterback issue. And so what are your thoughts on this game? Yeah, it's an interesting game. Um, you know, rivalry game, you know, one of the oldest rivalries in college football. Um, you know, something I always, you know, as, as someone who enjoys the tradition of college football, I always like to tune into this game. But it's kind of a bummer that, you know, one of the teams has fired their coach already this season. And, you know, it's, you know, Notre Dame's uh, a solid favorite in this one. Um USC's defense isn't that great. And, and so I, I think that uh, the, the quarterback situation um, for Notre Dame probably won't, you know, affect their chances at winning as, as it might against uh, a team with a better defense. Um, you know, if, if I'm Brian Kelly, you know, I'm, I'm looking at uh, some of the games that USC has played and lost earlier this year. Like if you look at the, the Oregon state game, I think they, we're just content with running the ball and you USC couldn't stop it and, and they won. So, you know, I, I think that would be kind of my game plan going into the game. Um, maybe that means starting Tyler Buckner instead of Jack Cohen. And if, you know, if the game turns into a shootout, which for Irish fans, hopefully not, um, you know, maybe then you bring in Jack Cohen. I think the key matchup in this game though, is, is going to be um, Notre Dame's defense against uh USC, I mean, you know, Slovis and London are, are – uh, there's a pretty solid connection there. Drake London's probably a first-round, maybe early second-round pick in the draft next year. Um, and Notre Dame has a, uh, a pretty good secondary. It's been improving. Um, you know, they obviously have an elite safety in, in Kyle Hamilton. Um, you know, I think the uh, – the supporting cast around him has, you know, has gradually improved as season has gone on. So I think if Notre Dame prevents this from being um, a shootout, I think that they can win the game just by, you know, you know, um, controlling the time of possession on the ground and, you know, limiting big plays from USC. So I would probably, and especially because, you know, it's, it, it's below a key number of seven. I, I think I would probably go Notre Dame here. Um, they've had a much more difficult schedule. You know, I, I think, I think you're right, Ed, that both teams are, are overrated. Um, but I, I just think that Notre Dame is a better team and they have the, the personnel to kind of limit, um, what USC is good at doing. So, yeah. Are you confident enough in Notre Dame to bet that at six and a half, or is it more so just a lean if you had to pick on that one? I would say it's more of a lean. Um, Yeah. Probably more of just, at this point. I haven't I haven't checked my numbers in a while, but uh, but I just looked. Uh, USC's defense, as you said, is terrible, like a hundredth or worse in in my adjusted success rate. The pass offense has been pretty good. They're eleventh in my adjusted success rate, which has been right where Keaton Slovis has had them the last two years. Obviously, there was that one game with Jackson Dart uh, where he took over and they won that game, and then he got hurt and Slovis got the job back. Uh, so that's probably helping the numbers, but um, but yeah, it's kind of surprised that 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 pass offense is that good, given everything else that's going on with that team. Yeah, definitely. 
And there has certainly been a lot that has gone on with that team. Uh, where else do you see betting value for this week, Michael, across all games in college football? Um, so I have one other game circled. Um, that's Tennessee against Alabama. Um, I think Tennessee is a little bit underrated. I know their record's like right around 500. But if you if you look at their schedule and who they've played, you know, they've crushed the teams that they're supposed to beat. And they've, they've uh, you know, hung tough against, you know, the tougher opponents in the SEC with the exception of Florida. So I think that Tennessee is, you know, I mean, obviously their record's not going to show it because of the conference that they play. But I think they're, they're a good team. Um, you know, Alabama isn't on that level that they were last year or that Georgia is this year. So I think, like, I'm not saying that I think that Tennessee is going to go into Tuscaloosa and, and, you know, potentially pull the upset or anything crazy like that. But I do think that they could keep it within three touchdowns. Um, I think the the line opened at, like, minus 27 and a half, and it's already down to minus 24 and a half. So, you know, try to get on that as soon as you can. <laughs> um, is Tennessee uh, – they're playing hooker at quarterback, even though Milton's yeah. healthy, or is Milton, Milton hurt, or what is um, going on there? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, Milton's gotten a couple of reps. I think he got a couple of reps, uh, you know, last week against Ole Miss. But I, I think, um, you know, if if Tennessee fans thought that uh, Joe Milton was their quarterback of the future, let me just tell you, as a uh, Michigan fan, um, that is a mistake. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, Hooker has been a lot better for this, this team. And, you know, obviously he won the job over, so – but that's definitely the one I'm circling. I, I you know, I wrote about uh, the Ole Miss in Tennessee game last week, and I bet on the under, which which cashed in luckily. And By like thirty points, yeah. pretty much. <laughs> I mean, I, my whole my whole argument for for betting the under there was if Tennessee can you know play well enough to win, you know that means that they're you know limiting Ole Miss's offense and and kind of you know making Matt Corral beat you with his arm. And I, I think that the you know, they, they did play it well enough to win. They just, you know, didn't get, you know, all the breaks going their way. So I, I think that um, they're good enough to, you know, so that we won't see Alabama's second string coming in in the middle of the, in the, middle of the third quarter. So I, I think they'll keep it close enough um, that I would, I would take the 24 and a half. You mentioned Tennessee steamrolling bad teams, and some people will, like, discount – games against bad teams because they're bad teams, but that's what you're supposed to do. And that is a good indicator. Like that's, that's something to, to value for sure. So uh, Michael likes Tennessee plus 24 and a half. That is Michael Rondello. Check him out on Twitter at Michael Rondello and check out all of his work over at numberfire.com. Michael, we appreciate the time. Good luck to you with your bets in week number eight. And hopefully we'll talk to you once again here soon. Great. Thanks for having me guys. Thank you. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Michael Rondello for swinging by and breaking down his thoughts on this weekend's game. One of them we discussed, but didn't get his thoughts on from a spread perspective, was Michigan versus Northwestern. Currently, Michigan, a 23.5 point favorite against Northwestern. It sounds like you want to talk about that one for covering the future for today. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we got to go back to that Northwestern game. You know, they had a solid 14 point win over Rutgers, but. You know, they had a big play, a 64-yard touchdown pass in Luke Washington where Rutgers missed a tackle. So when you kind of dig more into the underlying metrics, it wasn't as good for Northwestern. They had a 30.4% success rate compared to 348 for Rutgers. So both were well below the college football average of around 41%. Uh, but Northwestern was still uh, down a little bit. So one of the reasons my numbers do not like Northwestern is that they've struggled on both sides of the ball in terms of adjusted success rate and the game against North uh, Rutgers didn't really change that. So they're still 105th on offense, 104th on defense. And I really see that like, this is going to be a problem uh, against Michigan. So, you know, this is a team that had a lot of questions coming in to the season after a two and four year last year. And, you know, as we discussed uh, with Michael, I think new defensive coordinator Michael McDonald seems like the answer. So they're 22nd in my adjusted success rate on that side of the ball. The pass defense is 41st, and that might not seem great, and it isn't great. But, again, it's the same exact players that he had last year. Um, On the offense, you know, it's really been the ground game that's been great. They're 26th in adjusted success rate for rushing. Uh, Still some questions at the quarterback position, as we talked about with Michael 
uh, between Katie McNamara and JJ McCarthy. Um, so, you know, my model uh, actually likes Michigan by 22 and a half points. So I bet this at 21 and a half earlier this week, sending it out to my members. Uh, it has moved two points since then. I still think there's a little bit of value in this in the sense that, you know, uh, a, cu- a couple of games ago, the market took a stand and said, you know, we're going to make Michigan a couple points bigger favorite than, than whatever my numbers are saying. This is the type of respect that Alabama normally gets. I don't really think we've seen anything from Michigan to, to change that. Uh, I think there was value on Michigan because of what happened in the Rutgers game last week for Northwestern. Um, I think this might get to 24, maybe not too much past that. But, you know, I, I think Michigan has, has gotten, uh, you know, I, right now they're, they're not going to be favored against Ohio State. But I think they have gotten back to the Harbaugh level before uh, the last couple of years. And uh, it'll be interesting. Like, I, I think this team does have a ceiling. Uh, it comes at the quarterback position. But I do like them to cover this pretty big spread against Northwestern. Well, yeah, and you were talking about how Michigan has done nothing to change our opinion where the books are giving them respect. Northwestern did nothing to change the opinion either in that Rutgers game. Because you mentioned the the Washington play, like 99 times out of 98, that guy's getting taken down. I have no idea what happened with the Rutgers defender. He, I don't know, he just ate dirt or whatever whatever happens. I think he missed tackles at a higher percentage than that, but... But yeah, I mean, not that specific tackle because there was another guy like the safety was behind him, too. And he just like ran past it. And it was really weird aesthetically. Um, But I don't think Northwestern did anything there to change your opinion of them. And if you say before that Rutgers game, the Michigan's a 23 and a half point favorite. Like, I don't know what the look ahead line was if there was one, but it's probably bigger than 23 and a half. If I had to guess. And I don't think anything really changed tangibly there. Other thing, too, with a big number in this game is Northwestern's passing offense is not one you worry about in terms of like a backdoor cover. So I think that that right. would be reassuring in terms of betting a large number too. Yeah. So I think that 23 and a half is uh, probably the right read here. It was fun to watch Northwestern play decent football for a week. I mean, at least from an explosive play perspective, not from a sex a success rate perspective, but I'll take my one week and I'll cash it out and I'll just uh, try to avoid TVs oh. during this game this week. Oh, and before, uh, before I'm done talking about Michigan, um, I did talk a little bit about how I think Michigan State is overrated. Yeah, benefited from a lot, like a bit unsustainable rate of big plays. And uh, in that win against Indiana, they had that defensive touchdown. They had fewer over y- all yards than Indiana with their backup quarterback. I do feel like Michigan State's a little bit overrated. Uh, right now, I would make Michigan about five point favorite at Michigan State. So I'm really looking forward to what that line comes out at. Cause I feel like it's going to, I feel like it's going to be like two and a half, three. Right. And it's important too, because we record on Wednesdays. If you get a uh, two and a half on when on open on Sunday, yeah. that's something you want to jump on now. I think it's good to mention that now ahead of time, unless something changes drastically on Saturday, which I, you know, you maybe. need like an injury basically to make that happen. Um, maybe. Uh, I would also say that like I'm posting my college football numbers on Sunday night because yep. it's an absolute necessity um so if you want to get into that you can uh check out uh the power rank.com the power rank not actually to, to to sign up become a member um, especially now that is key so the power rank.net to get those numbers earlier on the week yeah i cannot emphasize how crazy things move on monday yeah uh when i talked to mike craig he's like i've, I've never seen anything like this this is insane <laughs> I, I do not know why I need to be completely prepared for Saturday on Monday, but that's right. just life this year. Yeah, apparently it is, and it's true in the NFL too. So uh, the powerrec.net to get those numbers as soon as you can. For my cover in the future, going to the NFL side of things this week, and we talked last week, Ed, about how you've talked to Rob Pizzola about how he's tracked bets on bad teams and how they perform. And he's shown or he's seen from himself that when he bets on bad teams, it doesn't typically work in his favor. I'm going to go against that this week, and which is dumb because I don't like doing things that are counter to what Rob Pizzola says. Generally not a, a sorry to play things, but I'm going to bet Houston plus 17 and a half against Arizona in week number seven. I just think that number is too big right now because part of this is we're talking here on Wednesday and Terod Taylor is labeled as day to day. And there's a shot that he comes back off of IR this week. And Taylor was playing really well before he got hurt. That'd be a pretty big upgrade for this offense. Davis Mills hasn't been bad, honestly, but like, if you get Terod Taylor back, I feel like that would still be an upgrade there. But even with Taylor missing a bunch of time, Houston's still 25th in schedule-adjusted passing efficiency right now. 
they're not outlierishly bad on that side of the football. They're not great defensively, but again, they're not like an outlier either. So if you're looking at 17 and a half against Arizona, which a team that I respect, but to get to 17 and a half, you need this team to be outlierishly bad. And like, they kind of aren't like they're bad, but they're not like an outlier in, in that sense. I do like Arizona. I bet them last week at plus three, despite my concerns around Kyler Murray's shoulder and stuff like that. They are pretty high in my power rankings. So I have nothing against Arizona, but 17 and a half is a big number against a team that's at least putting forth an effort this year. They're trying to do some cool things schematically on offense too. My numbers have this one as a 14 point game in Arizona's favor. That's three and a half points of value, which is tough to find in week seven. I'm having trouble finding a lot of games with a lot of value. This is one. You're getting also a cross key number 17 here. It feels like this line might be just, I don't know if this is like conspiracy theory, but like kind of juiced up to discourage teasers, it seems like at this point. Uh, so I'll take advantage here and play this out by itself and take Houston plus 17 and a half in this one. Ed, it makes me nervous to bet a bad team. I've bet Houston before this year and I'm doing it again now, but I think with this number where it's at and with the possibility that Terod Taylor plays, I think 17 and a half is just too big. And we have to remember that uh, Kyler Murray has a bum shoulder or something right. wrong with the shoulder. I don't know right. if anything came out. I didn't see the game against Cleveland. I was just watching the score. But... He played well. He threw the ball downfield too, despite there being some wins. So my, I was very concerned about his shoulder going in, which is why I was hesitant to bet it. Despite the fact my number showed like five points of value at plus three. Um, I was hesitant to bet it because I was worried about his shoulder. I did still do it because I thought five points was too much um, in terms of like where deviating from my number. But I'm less concerned now because of the, like the, he, the willingness he had to throw down field and stuff like that, but it's still not totally gone. Right. So I think that's another factor in, in your favor. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think I'm going to, well, I haven't decided about this game, but I definitely think there's, there's going to be places where I'm going to be going against Arizona over the next couple of weeks, probably against the Rams although not this week. <laughs> um, I think these teams are, are playing well. I think they're good, but they're probably going to be getting too much credit in the markets over the next couple of weeks. And uh, it'll be, you know, I think there'll be opportunities to fade both those teams. There are a lot of big numbers this week. So if you are afraid of big numbers, it might not be the week in the NFL. There are a bunch. So we'll talk more about those tomorrow with Drew Dinzik. Uh, you can find that by subscribing to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. While you're there again, leave us a rating review that does help us out a bunch. That is all that we have here for today. That's so we're going to close up shop for today. Big thank you once again to Michael Rondello for swinging by, breaking down his thoughts on this weekend's college football games. Find him on Twitter at Michael Rondello and check out his work over at numberfire.com. Ed, you mentioned the powerrank.net for the college football numbers on Sunday. What else going on for you this week? Yeah, my free email newsletter. Try to give uh, you some of the best advice uh, with a little bit of humor. You can check out... Uh, my analysis of Atlanta at Miami, which went out to the newsletter yesterday. It's on my site, uh, but sign up for the newsletter at thepowerrank.com. I've also been doing seven nuggets Saturday with uh, mostly with Edward Egross's help. Try to summarize injuries and tips and uh, other important resources that you might want. So anyways, that's all in the email newsletter. Go to thepowerrank.com. And you can find Ed on Twitter at The Power Rank and check out his podcast, The Football Analytics Show, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your college football bets if you're betting the Coastal Carolina game tonight. Either way, we'll talk to you once again tomorrow to break down NFL week number seven. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. What's up, guys? This is Jordan Spieth. If you're watching this video, please like and subscribe to the FanDuel YouTube channel.